Hi guys, today we're going to talk about a new paper from Nature Communications in which the researchers took design cues from nature to improve upon the basic approach to solar cells. Specifically, they were trying to make solar cells a little bit more like leaves on a tree. In this video, we're going to talk about why this matters, how it works, and I'll make some predictions as to whether I think it's likely to be implemented in the near future. So whenever I'm looking at new research that has anything to do with renewable energy, I always like to look at the big picture to just kind of reset our expectations about where we are and where we might be going in the near future. So um, especially pertaining to kind of the energy mix and the electricity mix. And so there's some great charts in um, the website Our World and Data that I like to look at. And this chart here is called uh, points out that more than one third of global electricity comes from low carbon sources, but a lot less of the total energy does. So whenever we're talking about solar panels in the future, people like Elon Musk like to make it sound like we're just around the corner from making most of our energy from solar and wind and things like that. And um, I like to look at this data kind of as a uh, reality check. Uh, so this is based on the primary energy and electricity mix in 2019. And so when you just look at when you're just thinking about electricity, you know what what's going on when you plug anything into your wall to, to power things, that's just a relatively small, um, or that's not really the whole picture when it comes to energy. But if you just look at electricity, see that solar is up to about 2.7% of the total production. Um, the vast majority is, is really obviously fossil fuels, oil, coal, and gas make up most of it. But a decent percentage by this time is low emission technology. And that includes nuclear and if you've watched other videos from me you probably know that i'm a huge fan of nuclear energy but also hydropower and and then wind solar and other renewables but when you take into account the total energy production and so this is going to include electricity transportation and heat it's uh it's a significantly lower fraction of our total energy comes from low emission sources and so we've got nuclear is is 4.3 percent instead of 10.4 and solar, which is the subject of today's conversation, is uh, just 1.1% of our total energy. What that implies is that we really need to not only increase the amount of solar and other low emission technology that we're utilizing, but we also need to improve the efficiency. And I would argue that any, any changes that you can make to the efficiency might be even a bigger lever for, for improving the energy mix in terms of uh, low emission technology. And as today's paper explores, a huge factor in the efficiency of solar cells is actually the question of what do you do with excess heat? So obviously when the sun shines down on a solar panel, some of those photons are absorbed for making electricity, but the majority of them are in the wrong wavelength and are just uh, not captured in terms of the, the total efficiency of the solar cell. A lot of that ends up making the cell hotter. And as the cell heats up, the efficiency drops because the, uh, the structure, the microstructure of the materials in question starts to become less conducive to electrical production. So the crux of this paper is the claim that the researchers make that by employing a leaf-inspired design for cooling solar panels, they can actually improve the efficiency of the solar panels by 13.6%. In terms of the big picture, if you could employ a strategy like this, this could look like a significant improvement in the efficiency overall of solar production and probably contribute to an improvement in the energy mix in terms of the contribution of energy coming from low emission technologies. Okay, so let's talk about how this works. So as I said before, this is essentially a biomimetic approach, which is to say it's mimicking nature. As I said, they took their design from nature, so let's look at the leaf first. So as you probably remember from school, there's capillary action in the stem of a plant in which these narrow bundles, these vascular bundles, are essentially using the cohesion of water, taking advantage of that, and rather the adhesion of water, to wick water up through the, the stem and then out into the leaf. What happens next, and this was new information for me because I'm, I'm not really much of a biologist, is that at the terminals of these stem systems in the leaf, so you have these vascular bundles which bring the water now into the leaf 
and the water is then transported into these sponge cells, which are cells that can absorb a lot of water. From there, the water is able to transpire and, and evaporate out of the stomata, which are the, these little holes in the uh, in the bottoms of the leaf and this is essentially going on all the time especially when it's warm but this is a cooling structure and obviously you know photosynthesis utilizes water as one of the the key components now the photovoltaic cell design here is is very much a, a a mimicry of the leaf because you have the top in the leaf you have the sunlight coming down and hitting the top of the leaf and in the photovoltaic cell, you have the sunlight coming down and hitting the top of the, of the assembly. And then in the photovoltaic cell, instead of having the vascular bundles, which are just part of the leaf, they actually made a fiber bundle, which is connected to a reservoir of water. And then instead of sponge cells, they have um, hydrogels. And so the hydrogels are, cons are composed of a superabsorbent material called potassium polyacrylate, which is a superabsorbent material. It's basically just um, something that does not dissolve in water, but ab can absorb a lot of water. And then they have, I believe they do have perforations in the membrane below the superabsorbent component of the assembly. And that is essentially like the stomata of the leaves and lets the uh, water kind of transpire out. And obviously when it does that, because of the heat of evaporation, it is able to cool the cell. This is basically like sweating. Actually, it's almost identical to the mechanism of sweating. The idea is that this is going to passively cool down the cell. The paper points out that thermal management has proven to be effective at removing heat from photovoltaic cells by employing either water or air flows. But the problem with that is that this usually requires heat exchanging structures, and introduces design, installation, and operational complexity, as well as additional cost, and are associated with parasitic electrical consumption. Basically, if, if you have um, a system that requires you to be pumping coolant through a system, then the pump obviously operates on electricity, and that's removed from the total production of your solar photovoltaic cell. This leaf-like design instead would actually be essentially a, a passive approach. In terms of whether or not this works, I think that maybe the, one of the most important points is the uh, electrical production efficiency, which is shown in, in figure uh, E right down here in the middle. And you can see that the efficiency with just the, the cell is 13.2% and the leaf design increases it to 15%, which is an improvement of 13.6% in efficiency. And that's pretty exciting because it's just a design change, but you don't have to actually uh, do much beyond just setting up the initial design. So to connect the dots on how the efficiency is actually obtained, I think that figure three here, which is passive control of the PV leaf transpiration operation and performance at different ambient temperatures, kind of shows us what we're looking at. So figures 3B and 3C are really interesting to me because in the first one, the ambient temperature is 24.1 degrees C, which is like a slightly warm room. And you can see the temperature uh, with time. So as the experiment goes on, we go up to about 3000 seconds. And you can see how the temperature of different designs changes under these conditions when the light is shining. So when the sunlight is shining down, you can see that the ambient temperature is down here in gray. It doesn't really change. It's about 24 degrees the whole time. But the surfaces that are being struck by the sunlight are actually heating up in response to this. And, and that has a lot to do with the fact that, um, as we said before, only a small percentage of the total heat or total energy from the sun is actually absorbed by the cell to make electricity. And the rest is different things happens with it. Some of it bounces off and some of it is absorbed as heat. And you can see that the uh, photovoltaic cell actually heats up quite a bit. It gets as high as 60 degrees C, even though the day is not that warm. It's, it's kind of a relatively comfortable day simulated in the lab. Conversely, the photovoltaic leaf design, which has the passive cooling, heats up only to 40 degrees. So that's a over a 20 degree difference, which is amazing. They also measure the transpiration rate, which is the rate at which the water is is flowing through the vascular bundles and then and then being released in the passive cooling design. And it does make sense that as time goes on and the photovoltaic cell is absorbing a lot of thermal energy, that the transpiration rate is increasing. And that's what's responsible for keeping the PV leaf temperature lower. What's really interesting to me is that if you then 
uh, do the same experiment, but they did the same experiment at a warmer temperature. So the ambient temperature was 33.5 degrees C, which is significantly hotter. You can see that the ambient temperature is, is higher, obviously, and the solar cell gets way hotter. It gets almost to 70 degrees centigrade. And by this time, to the extent that the energy production is dependent on the, uh, the temperature, you're really going to be losing a lot of efficiency. And you can see that the transpiration rate, though, this is with a solar leaf design, is increasing. And the, uh, the, the PV leaf temperature is the same temperature as it was in the other experiment. And so the rate of transpiration is essentially moving with the ambient temperature and keeping the PV leaf in an optimal temperature range. So in terms of whether this is likely to be implemented in the near future, I think that a lot of the materials are uh, pretty easy to come by. So the vascular bundles are made out of bamboo and the super absorbent material, sodium polyacrylate, or rather, sorry, potassium polyacrylate is extraordinarily common and low cost. Actually, it's used in, as an agricultural product. And so it's made in very, very large scales. So, so far, so good. Um, the, the main thing that gives me some pause about the likelihood that this could be implemented is the fact that in order to work, you need to actually be consuming water. Now, the authors do actually demonstrate that you can use salt water. So they argue that you could use ocean water um, and, and you don't really need like fresh water or anything like that. So you could picture in certain areas um, that if you could be hopefully be close enough to uh, a salt water source or just a low cost water source that you might be able to really employ this technology. So in all fairness, this uh, water management issue is something that the researchers actually delve into quite a lot. And they developed a, a further set of experiments in which they showed that, that you could actually collect clean water from the water vapor that was evaporating from the, uh, the PV leaf technology. And so the idea is that you would need to essentially create a condensing chamber below where the transpiration is occurring and collect some of that water vapor. The only problem with this from my point of view is that I think it's taking a really simple and easy to execute idea and kind of making it a little bit more complex or even a lot more complex. In their design for the water vapor condensation, they involve a ventilation fan and uh, there's just a level of complexity that starts to make it, I think, a little bit harder to implement. And the reason I bring up complexity as a bad thing is that as a scientist who works in industry, though not in this field, one of the main mantras that I try to keep in mind is that is, is the mantra that complexity breeds cost. And so the more complex a system is, the more likely you are to experience cost overruns that are gonna make it probably less likely for a new technology to be implementable. I really, really like the core of the technology because it's so simple. Just the idea that you can take these low cost materials like bamboo and, uh, and an agricultural super absorbent polymer and drastically improve the temperature control of a photovoltaic cell in a passive way that doesn't require energy is amazing. Um, on top of that, the researchers demonstrate that you can use salt water or you can use fresh water. And I think that's really simple and really powerful. I think trying to extend this into being a water production technique as well just decreases the likelihood of it being implemented. Another thing that gives me some pause about the technology is that in the paper, they also demonstrated that as the relative humidity increases, the ambient relative humidity, the efficiency of the cooling technique also decreases, um, which makes sense, right? Because if, if you have if a lot of water vapor in the air already and your cooling technique requires evaporation, then that becomes a little bit less likely to occur at the rate that you would need to cool down. To me, this limits the optimal use case of such a technology to uh, an environment where you have a combination of abundant water and uh, low relative humidity. So something like, I guess I could picture this being um, a more desert-like climate adjacent to a large body of water. This, I think, makes it a little bit less likely or really a lot less likely to be used in places um, like in the U.S. that I can think of, like uh, Arizona or, or 
uh, Southern California or something like that, where you have a lot of sunlight all the time, but um, they're often undergoing drought conditions. But overall, if you could find the right place to implement this technology, I think that it would work. And on top of that, you don't really need any fancy materials to make it happen. You just need, uh, you need water and all of the materials are low cost and likely to be easy to fabricate. So I think this is a super cool paper and I was really excited to read it. And I hope that you learned something today. Thanks for watching.